may be seated. It's this time my privilege to introduce again to you Elder Dan Swain from the Pilgrim Presbyterian Bible Church. Elder Dan, preach, preach the word. Thank you, Keith. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning. Although I'm from the Pilgrim Presbyterian Bible Church in Maryland, I was born and raised just a little bit south of here in the wilds of Salem County. Grew up in the thriving megalopolis of Harmersville, and my Baptist mother always warned me to watch out for those Presbyterians. Well, by the grace of God, I not only didn't watch out for them, I ended up marrying one and embracing uh, the love of the tradition of our Presbyterian forefathers. If you'll turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 17 and verse 16. Acts 17 and verse 16. As you're turning there in the way of background, I understand that Pastor Spencer has been in the book of Acts, but the setting of this particular verse is during Paul's second missionary journey. He's traveling throughout the Northeast Mediterranean, visiting churches, establishing churches, encouraging churches. He's just been forced to leave the city of Berea uh, because of opposition there, and he intends to travel to Corinth. And on the way, in the providence of God, he has a brief layover in the city of Athens. Pilgrim, or excuse me, you're not pilgrims, you're Christian brothers and sisters, but Christians. Never be discouraged by those layovers that are unexpected in your path. God may be doing something very, very wonderful during that time. Here in Athens, he encounters something he's never experienced before, a city wholly given to idolatry. Now, certainly, Paul had experienced idolatry. It was very common in the world in that day, but he had never seen something to the level that he sees here in Athens. Acts 17:16. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Let's pray. Father, we ask this morning that you will guide us through this passage and guide our hearts as we seek to understand your word. We pray, Lord, that your word would be magnified in our midst today, that we might receive from it that which you would have for us to know. We ask that it might be done to your glory. In Christ's name, amen. The Greek word idolatria is from two, uh, two other words. It talks about the worship of false gods and all the wicked practices associated with the worship of false gods. The two words it's from, eidolon, which means anything intended to represent some other thing, real or imaginary. Now that can include false gods, but it can also include things like shades of the departed, phantoms, apparitions, imaginations. The second part of the word latria in this context means service for hire. So the meaning of these words combined together give us the idea of being the menial hired servant to a slave or an image that represents some figure, some shape, some likeness, some god, creature, spirit, ghost, or idea. This message is entitled Serving Shadows because that communicates the essence of idolatry, being a slave or a servant to a fleeting image, to a shadow, something of no real substance. Now, Christian, we're supposed to be consider ourselves servants of God also, but the difference is that there's no implication that we are servants for hire. Romans 4.4 4 says, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Furthermore, service to God is not service to an inanimate object or some nebulous idea, but it's to the true and living God, 1 Thessalonians 1.9, as demonstrated in, his Lord, in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is known as the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, Hebrews 1.3. So what does a city wholly given to idolatry look like? It's a city that's completely filled with and dedicated to the service of idols. Imagine beautiful and grotesque images of every kind filling temples and monuments dedicated to this god and that god. Athens' biggest and most impressive architecture was dedicated to the service and worship of idols. These ostentatious buildings were the outward manifestation of the inward problem of inward idolatry, mankind creating his own gods. You see, God has blessed mankind with powerful creative abilities, given many wonderful skills and talents in the arts. And those talents and abilities are, be, are to be used to worship and serve God. However, all too often we end up serving that thing that we have created ourselves. We end up serving shadows. So what are the biggest, most expensive, most ostentatious buildings in our world today? Sports arenas, movie theaters, universities, amusement parks, the Amazon warehouse, business headquarters, laboratories, prisons. You see, large buildings cast large shadows. 
There was a time in our nation's history when the biggest building in every community would most likely have been the church. We're sitting in a very large church today. And unlike the idolatrous megachurches that seem to thrive around us, the purpose of those churches being so big was simple mathematics. A large portion of the population went to church and you needed a big building in which to house them. Christian, what are the biggest buildings in your life? What are the biggest edifices in your life? What do you spend the most amount of time, money, and labor building? According to Jude 120, ye beloved should be building up yourselves on your most holy faith. Your faith in Jesus Christ should be the biggest building in your life, the biggest structure, the main frame around which it's all focused. So should we consider these Athenians to be backward and old fashioned because they were idol worshipers? You know, atheistic educators and scientists today try to tell us that the whole idea of God came about as primitive man evolved and he wanted to come up with ways to explain the unexplainable things around them, such as natural disasters or astronomical phenomenon or life or death or war or women, all those unexplainable things in the world around us. You see, Athens was the education and philosophy powerhouse of its day the ancient worldwide center for science and learning and thinking and the elevation of ideas. But along with all that, it was also the world center for idolatry. Named after the city itself was named after the goddess Athena. According to Matthew Henry, where human learning most flourished, idolatry most abounded. The gods worshiped there were a physical manifestation of the ideas put forth by the teachers, the scientists, the mathematicians, and the philosophers of the day. Now today, those atheists are proponents of reason and science, and they claim that that banishes superstition and religion. You know one of the biggest growing uh, idolatrous or false religions that's going on today in our modern world of science and knowledge? Satanism is on the rise. It's growing in followers much more than can be expected. Along with it, it's twin sister witchcraft. So we allegedly live in a reasoned, ordered scientific society, and yet false religion continues to abound. So here in Athens, where science and discovery were highly respected, superstition was literally everywhere. Deep thought and introspection, learning and knowledge, separated from scripture, leads to the creation of false gods. Romans 1.22, they professed themselves to be wise, and they became fools. Notice that the city was full of, of idols dedicated to every false deity imaginable, but there was no true worship of the true and living God. You would think using the blind squirrel finding a nut theory that somebody would have stumbled across the one true and living God and his worship would have been practiced there, but that wasn't the case. They were being misled by satanic influence to keep them from the knowledge of God. And you know, they were willing to accept any form of worship, any form of God, anything went in the, in the line of religion except for the worship of the true and the living God. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound like the world in which we live today where anything is tolerated except for the gospel of Jesus Christ? However, Satan could not suppress the idea and the knowledge that there really is a God out there. And he's not one of these statues or one of these images that we have here to worship. And so what they did is they came up with this idol to the unknown God that they worshipped sort of like an insurance policy. Just uh, in case we missed anything, God. Something to back us up in case we made a mistake here. Today we call that Pascal's Wager where the scientist says, it's better to believe in God and then die and find out you were wrong than to live your whole life not believing in God and die and find out you were wrong. Well, obviously that's not what the scripture teaches, but that's the situation that Paul encountered in Athens. So what was this impact? What impact did this idolatry have on Paul? We read in our text, his spirit was stirred in him. The extent of idolatry in Athens was enough to stir his spirit. That word stir means to be sharpened, to be spurred on, to be irritated, provoked, or angered. Are you spurred, irritated, provoked, or angered by the sin that we see going on around us in the world today? Are we provoked and irritated and spurred on by the sin that takes place in our own lives? Christian, we should be. It's like Exodus 32.1, when Moses came down from the camp, uh, from the mountain and saw the idolatry going on in the camp. It says, his anger waxed hot 
and he cast the tables out of his hands and break them. In Psalm 119, we read, I beheld the transgressors and was grieved because they kept not thy word. In Matthew 21, 12, we read that Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. And in 2 Peter 2, 7, we read about Lot, who was vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. And then 2 Peter 2, 8, we read more that that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day. Lot was vexed in his soul by the wickedness he saw going on around him in, in uh, Sodom. So what is our response to sin and idolatry? Does it vex us? Do we do anything about it? Paul was provoked to action. Later on in this passage, we read that the action he took was to dispute with the people in the synagogues and the markets daily. He was provoked to daily action fighting against sin. Christian, what does it take for you to get into a dispute with someone? Do we get into disputes over minor inconsequential things? One reason for the problems we face today is that Christians have been far too silent about far too much for far too long long. It's worth disputing, conversing, discussing, and arguing over sin. That's something that we should get excited about, that we should find it vexing to us and we should speak out against it. So what was Paul's message to the city after he was vexed, after he started reasoning with the people? When given the opportunity to speak on Mars Hill, which was the actual heart of idolatry in Athens, he pointed out the foolishness of idolatry. He compared it to superstition. He called it ignorance, such as we read about in Proverbs 122. How long, ye simple ones, will you love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Idolatry is a lack of knowledge. It's a lack of understanding. And then he declared the true and living God to the people to whom he spoke. In verses 24 and 25, he told them that God made them, that God gave them life, that God gave them breath, that God gave them everything. But the gods that they worshipped couldn't give them anything at all. The gods that they worshipped had to be served by their own hands. The foolishness of serving shadows is that you come to these idols asking them to provide for you, asking them to take care of you, wherein everything they have is what you gave them in the first place. It's like in Exodus 32 when the people made the golden calf. Where did that gold come from? Well, it was the earrings that the people broke off their ears and gave to Aaron. Or in Isaiah 40, verses 19 and 20, we read about the workman melting a graven image. We read that he is so impoverished that he has no oblation. He's so poor, he can't afford to give an offering in the temple, in the tabernacle, and worship to God. And yet he seeks out a tree that will not rot. He seeks unto him a cunning workman to prepare a graven image that shall be, not be moved. So this man that is so poor, he's providing the substance to make his idol, to make his God. It's like as if you were hired to do a job. You were given a new course of employment. You were promised a good salary. But when payday rolled around, the boss came to you and said, I need to borrow some money from you so that I can pay you. Well, that's ridiculous. That's circular reasoning. And that sort of thing would fall and collapse under its own weight. But that doesn't seem to be the case with idolatry. Somehow it continues on, even though it's such a foolish proposition. Now, we know that there are those that profit on the deal. We read in Acts 19 about Demetrius the silversmith, who said, Sirs, you know that by this craft we have our wealth. They made their livings making these idols to sacrifice, uh, for people to sacrifice unto. Today, there are many that still profit from distorting the true God of Scripture and selling shadows for people to worship. There's the prosperity preachers and the TV evangelists. There's the Church of Rome, the wealthiest church on the planet. There's the sports and entertainment celebrities and the supporters of all sorts of sin. There's money to be had in false gods. There's a reason that idolatry is still with us today. After preaching in Athens, Paul departed from them in verse 33 with just a few converts. He had just a few converts after all of his witnessing and preaching the gospel in that city of Athens. Yet he wasn't discouraged just like we should not be discouraged today when we see just a few people gathered in worship of the true and living God. It's his will that's brought us here, and be thankful for being delivered from the sin of idolatry. And in verse 34, we read that Paul went on to Corinth. And that's why we read that passage in 1 Corinthians today. I'm going to refer to it now to make a few points from it that Paul made to the church in Corinth. 
Remember how he concluded that passage. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. In 1 Corinthians 10, verses 7 and 10, Paul gives four examples from Israel's history to demonstrate that the heart of their idolatry, the reason that Israel turned to idolatry, was because that they took something about the true God and changed it to fit their circumstances. They, in effect, took the true and living God and modified him in their own power to make him fit what they thought the need was of the day. In each case, doing so brought down God's wrath upon them. In 1 Corinthians 10.7, we read, Neither be you idolaters, as some of them were. It is, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. That's referring to Exodus 32, when the people made the golden calf. According to a commentary on that in Psalm 106, they made a calf in Horeb and worshipped the molten image. They changed their glory into the similitude of an ox that eateth grass. Their sin in that particular case was taking the glory of God, the unviewable glory, holy, and majesty of God, and turning that into the image of an ox, a cow, a calf. The end result of that was the Levites spurred on by God's holy wrath to kill 3,000 men. This incident reminds us of what we read in Romans 1.23 that talks about our society today and, our, and the society that existed back then. It says, They changed the glory of an uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. And also Romans 1.25, Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Why would we do that? Why would people do that and exchange the glory of God for an image? John 4.24 tells us God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. But you realize it's easier to grasp hold of the physical. It's easier to grasp hold of an animate object, something that's actually there. Now, you can recognize that form of idolatry when you see somebody burning incense to an idol of Buddha or when you see kneeling in, someone kneeling in front of statues of saints and kissing them and praying to them. Idolaters find it more physically rewarding to worship idols. Christian, if the God you believe in can be represented by a created object, you are serving a shadow. Furthermore, if the God you believe in is not your creator, but or if he used some variation or process of evolution to create you, you are serving a shadow. You are not serving the true God. In 1 Corinthians 10.8, we're told, Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day twenty and three, three and twenty thousand. That was the aftermath of the trouble caused by wicked Balaam. He sought to curse Israel. God would not let him curse Israel, but he found a way to bring Israel down. He found a way to bring Israel down by causing them to intermingle with the Moabite women who were idol worshippers and who are fornicators. And that caused them to fall. And it says that they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. In Psalm 106, we read that, Thus they provoked him, that is to God, to anger with their inventions, and a plague broke in upon them. So it was their inventions, their evil imagination, that led to the death of 20 and 3,000. So why would people do that? Why would people turn to sexual immorality in the worship of idols? Well, idol worship usually does involve behaviors that are otherwise taboo or forbidden. It provides an excuse. So is it any wonder that fornication is so prevalent in our society today? That that's the sin that's really the hallmark of our world today, fornication? Back in the days of scripture, society was not openly sexualized. People wore clothes, unlike they do today. Public nakedness was not permitted. Uh, extramarital affairs either ended in someone being stoned or somebody getting married. Things weren't tolerated that are tolerated in our world today. But idolatry permits and encourages immorality. And that's what, impl that's what is implied took place when the Israelites played before the golden calves. It means they took place in immoral, they took part in immoral behavior. And that's what happened with the Moabite God, the Moabite women worshiping their gods. Changing the truth that God hates fornication for a shadow that loves it. That cracked the door open a little bit. And of course today that door has been blown completely off the hinges. 
Christian, if the God you believe in does not consider fornication, adultery, marriage to unbelievers, homosexuality, transgenderism, abortion, if your God does not consider those things sin, then you are serving a shadow. In verse 9 of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul says, Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. That refers to what happened back in Numbers 21, where people were discouraged by the way through the wilderness. It was very difficult. It was hard. And they longed for the memory and the imagination of the bread that they used to eat in Egypt. And it says that they loathed this light bread. They grew to hate the manna that God miraculously provided for them from heaven. They hated the bread, realized that the bread that was represented there was the Lord Jesus Christ, that represented Jesus Christ, the bread of life. And therefore, they tempted Christ by loathing him and longing for Egypt instead. And then, of course, in 1 Corinthians 10.10, 10, neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. That refers to the repeated times that Israel murmured in the wilderness over the lack of water, the lack of food, the enemies that they faced. They accused Moses of bringing them into the wilderness of, to die. You realize that the first time they murmured was three days after they witnessed God destroy Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea. Three days later, they had forgotten that miraculous deliverance and were murmuring against God. So why would people do that? Why would people turn from deliverance that they had seen with their own eyes just three days ago to murmuring and complaining? Idolatry crept into Israel when things got hard. When food or water got scarce or temptation got too strong, instead of driving them to God, they threw up their hands in defeat because they did not believe that God could save them or provide for them. They sought to return to the gods of Egypt. Christian, if the God you believe in cannot supply your daily bread and all your needs, you're serving a shadow. Christian, if the God you believe in did not send his own son, the bread of heaven, down to save you, you are serving a shadow. If the God you believe in cannot take care of you, even if or when you die, you're serving a shadow. So we've looked at Athens and we see their idolatry so prevalent. We've taken a brief look at some events that took place in Israel's history and found that they were also very uh, given over to idolatry. So what about America today? What about the world in which we live? Are we too sophisticated to fall into this trap of idolatry? Those antiquated societies were actually more advanced and sophisticated when it comes to idolatry than we are today. They did a much better job of it than we do today. The Bible refers to idolatry as the work of men's hands. When we think of idolatry, we think of people bowing down to statues or worshiping things like money or possessions or power or status. So the ancient idolaters went through a lot of trouble to make a tangible image of their shadow god. So we're today tempted to think, well, if there's no actual image, if there's no physical idol that I'm bowing down to, then there can be no idolatry, right? No problem. In our modern age, nobody makes anything anymore. There's no manufacturing going on in the world today. We are lazy idolaters. We are, idolatry is now relegated to the work of the mind and the imagination. Just think about it. You imagine the God that you want. You change the God that exists to meet your circumstances. Building a God or an idol is too much work. Today we're into extreme personalization. Everything has to be personalized to suit my tastes specifically. <clears throat> uh, instead of cooperatively worshiping the same physical idol, each one of us is tempted to change things to make God meet our demands, to meet God meet what we expect of him. We look to make a God that casts a familiar shadow. We want to serve a God that casts a shadow that looks like us, because then we would feel more comfortable with that God than worshiping the God that's revealed to us in the scriptures. That's very prevalent today, and unfortunately, it's very prevalent even in the church today. This idolatry is exhibited in man-centered worship with music and prayer and preaching that's designed to appeal to the congregation rather than to be offered up unto God, which is the true purpose of worship. There's a man out there named Brian McLaren. He's very... Uh, a very prominent person, 
and uh, in the Christian world. And he's been rewriting some of the hymns because he finds that they're too old-fashioned. One of the hymns that he's rewriting is Onward Christian Soldiers because it's too warlike. And he doesn't think that that's necessary anymore. I wonder if he's also going to rewrite all the scriptural texts upon which these hymns are based. I wonder if Mr. McLaren is aware of the warfare against Satan. I wonder if he's aware of the persecution and killing of Christians that's happening literally today in the world in which we live. I wonder if he's familiar with the fact that Christians are to be in, at internal warfare with sin. It doesn't appear as though he's aware of these things. He wants to change the surroundings of the Christian faith to meet his idea of who God really is. Maybe the problem is not that onward Christian soldiers is too warlike. Maybe when you face the realities of our world today, it's not warlike enough. Maybe we need something even more powerful than that. Such worship only reveals a dim shadow of God, a dim realization of who this God truly is. So idolatry today is most commonly manifested not in people bowing down to an image or uh, worshiping an idol, although that's still very prevalent and does take place, but idolatry today is most commonly manifested by people making their own God. And that God is based on the one true God, but it's one that they say is the same God as the Bible, but he's one that's not really the same. He's similar, but not quite the same. And so we are guilty of idolatry whenever we believe something about God that's not expressly revealed in Scripture. And if you believe something about God and you make that the God that you worship and you can't point to chapter or verse to substantiate your belief, you're serving a shadow. We do that when we change the nature of God to conform to our own thinking. We do it when we think about not who God is, but who we think he is or who we think he should be. And that's a very common form of idolatry practiced today in Christendom at large. But of course, that temptation exists right here within each one of us as well to seek to fashion a God not based on the one in Scripture, but one who we think he should be. And that's manifested in many ways. If you believe in a God that tolerates or ignores sin, you're serving a shadow. If you believe in a God who has changed his mind about what sin is, you're serving a shadow. If you believe in a God whose main concern is social justice or equality, you're serving a shadow. If you believe in a God who is not concerned about personal holiness in your life, you're serving a shadow. If you believe in a God who cannot see or who does not care what your thoughts are, you're serving a shadow. If you believe in a God who will not send people to hell, you're serving a shadow. All of those things are people that commonly believe today, and yet you cannot point to them in Scripture. In addition to idolatry that stems from the creation of a God in the image of the creature, idolatry also creeps in when Christians become too fearful to judge between right and wrong. <clears throat> when there's so much temptation to accept what is clearly sinful as okay. Remember, it was in the middle of his discussion about idolatry when, when Paul wrote, There hath no temptation taken, to you, taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. So here he is giving this passage of scriptural truth about idolatry, and he pauses to talk to us about temptation. And that's because this temptation to change God to meet our standards is very real. And that's one of the temptations which we need to be alert for and aware of. When the pressure and temptation to conform is on, you are faced with the choice of accepting God for who he is, accepting his word for what it is, and calling sin, sin. If we give in to the temptation, we will deny who God is. We will deny what his word is, and we will deny what sin is in order to get along. And that's a very common temptation that we face today. It's the choice that sin of sinners either becoming conformed to the image of God versus God being conformed to the image and expectation of sinners. And that's a huge gulf. That's a huge difference. We're also tempted to fall into idolatry when we are faced with despair. 
To give up hoping in Christ when things get difficult is to say that there is a God who is unable to provide for us, who doesn't care or know what we need, or who does not love us. It's to turn to another God. It's to turn to a shadow. And when this despair comes upon us, when we have that feeling within ourselves, we're commanded to remember the former things of old. For I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Isaiah 46, 9. There is no other God but the Lord Jesus Christ whom we serve. Where else can we go? For he alone has the words of life. You see, unless you know the true and the living God, you cannot be grounded in faith. You cannot avoid the risk of despair and distress turning into idolatry. And you can't be grounded in that faith and you are, unless you are actually in that faith, unless you are actually a partaker of the faith in Jesus Christ. That means we need to be in the Word. It, needs to be, it means we need to be in church. It means we need to be in prayer. If we are not in those things, it won't happen. Without Christ, without the faith that he gives, when despair comes... When the trials come, you'll have nothing to fall back upon but that shadow God of your own imagination. You'll have only a shadow God, and you'll only have a shadow hope for deliverance. There is a God who is real. He is alive with power, wisdom, and authority. He has compassion. He has mercy. He has the keys to hell, and he is not like us. He is not our shadow. He's not a figment of our imagination. He's righteous and perfect and holy. That God really exists. And it is he who we are to be worshiping. Those temples in Athens now lie in ruins. The inhabitants of that city who were wholly given to idolatry are long dead, and they've gone on to judgment. The crumbling buildings no longer play host to the wicked and idolatrous practices that once took place there. Now they're just quaint reminders of a forgotten time. The temples and shrines were abandoned when the people moved on due to warfare, famine, a changing economy, or whatever reason moved them forward. And today, there is no one left to carry on those worshipful practices that they had in those idolatrous temples. Is that what our faith is? If you're trusting in anything other than the one true God, you are trusting in shadows. Psalm 144.4 says, Man is like to vanity. His days are as a shadow that passeth away. Everything you believe in, if you are worshiping shadows, will one day be gone. There will be nothing left except perhaps some quaint reminder that you existed. Maybe some broken down, dusty ruin inhabited by bats and pigeons. Christian, that's not what our faith is. Our faith is alive and vibrant and real because God is alive and vibrant and real. Psalm 84.4 reminds us, Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They will still be praising thee. Selah. Christian, be encouraged. Christian, don't give in to disappointment. Don't give in to temptation. Don't find yourself tempted to worship a God that does not exist. Don't change God to match your imagination or your expectations. Serve and worship the true God of the Bible. And as we're reminded in 1 John 5.21, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this admonition from Scripture and for this teaching that you provided for us because you truly do understand the weakness of mankind. You truly do understand the frame, uh, our frame, and it's in weakness. And you understand, Lord, that there are many temptations for us to change our idea of who you are and make it to conform to our image instead of, as we are commanded in Scripture, being conformed to your image. I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen your body. I pray, Lord, that you would give us strength, that we might stand in this day, and that we might find the strength to stand against the temptation to cave in to other people's ideas of who God is, that we might get along or be more readily accepted in our society. I pray, Lord, that we would cling to the scriptures, that we would cling to our God, and that we would serve you with our whole heart. There is no other God who died for us. There is no other Savior besides the Lord Jesus Christ. There is nowhere else that we can go. No one else has the words of life. We pray that you would embolden us, not just to stand firm in this faith that we've given, but, Lord, I pray that you would vex our spirits, vex our souls. May we have a strong desire burning within us to speak out against that which is wicked, whether it be within our own lives or whether it be in the world around us. Lord, make us to be brave, make us to be strong, and may we glorify you in all things. 
We thank you for this, and we ask you for your help. In the name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, amen.